Uh, we're delighted to have uh, uh, Larry Wright with us this evening. Of, of course, he's no stranger to the store, having appeared here several times before. And in fact, one of the remarkable things uh, about Larry is how familiar and talented a presence uh, he's been, uh, not just in the book world, uh, where he's won a, a Pulitzer Prize for one of his works, The Looming Tower, about uh, Al-Qaeda. Uh, but he's also made distinguished contributions in other artistic worlds. Uh, he's written movie scripts, composed stage plays, and appeared in uh, two one-man shows based on his journalism. He also knows his way around the keyboard as a, as a member of a, of a blues band. Uh, and that's in addition that's in addition to his, uh, his day job as a staff writer at The New Yorker, uh, where he's worked for, for more than 20 years. Uh, his latest book, 13 Days in September, grew out of a, a project that, that started as a play about the 1978 Camp David Summit. Uh, the play was commissioned by the uh, Arena Stage, which showed the production last April. Uh, but Larry ended up with much more material than could fit in the play um, um, much more material about what was, after all, uh, one of the great diplomatic triumphs of the, of the 20th century. Uh, and given that there were so few books devoted to recounting the pivotal talks between Jimmy Carter, Menachem Begin, uh, and Anwar Sadat, uh, Larry decided to write one himself. Uh, while Carter is still alive, and there are at least some surviving members of the Israeli and Egyptian delegations. The book reconstructs the discussions, the tensions, the courageous compromises uh, that resulted in a peace treaty, the likes of which hasn't uh, been, been matched since. Um, as Larry says at the start of the book, beneath the story of the summit is also a history of the modern Middle East, and beneath that is a clash among three great religions. Uh, watching the continuing chaos and bloodshed in, in the Middle East today, uh, we all can learn much from looking back at how three very imperfect leaders overcame their own limitations to forge an agreement uh, against all odds. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Larry Wright. Thanks, Brad, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's, gosh, the last time I was here, I was talking about Scientology. You know, here we are back in the Middle East. Um, I, I want to, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about how this, this play got started, because it really got started here. I mean, the book got started with a play here in Washington. Uh, and I got a call in 2011 from that man right there, Gerald Rafshoon. Uh And Jerry was uh, Jimmy Carter's media advisor in the White House. And it's been his dream to make a movie of Camp David, but uh, that hadn't happened. So he was asking if I would be willing to write a play. Uh, his pitch was a born-again Christian, a pious Muslim, and an Orthodox Jew go behind closed doors for 13 days and emerge with the only durable p peace treaty in the Middle East. I was pretty persuaded. Um, I had lived in Georgia when Carter was governor and when he ran for president. And uh, I had lived in Cairo. I was teaching at the American University there when Sadat became president. And as a reporter, I'd spent a fair amount of time in Israel. So all of this s beckoned to me. But I decided I would, I would have to treat it the way I would treat a New Yorker story or a book. I would research it just the same way with the same kind of intensity because it's reality that really calls to me. You know, what really happened is always more interesting than what one might imagine. Uh, so... Our adventure began with Jerry taking me down to Plains and introducing me to the president and, and Mrs. Carter. Um, they live in an incredibly modest house. Uh, they built it in after Jimmy's dad died in 1953, and uh, Carter 
resigned from the Navy, he had a very promising career, to go back and take over the failing family peanut warehouse. And let me tell you, Rosalind Carter was not happy about that. Uh, she did not want to go back to Plains. They'd been posted off in like Hawaii where she was taking hula lessons and Jimmy was playing the ukulele. This was, <laughs> that was the life she had in mind and suddenly they're back in Plains. And uh, as I said, the peanut warehouse was not doing well. He, they, were the, they lived in public housing when they got back. I think he's the only president to have ever lived in public housing. Uh, we uh, we met them in that that little house they built when they uh, finally got back on their feet, and uh, they sat in uh, on this blue chinch couch in the den with matching blue chinch curtains, and uh, a painting that Jimmy had done of the den that we were sitting in that looked just like an illustration from Goodnight Moon, <laughs> and so uh, Jerry says. Um, Mr. President, uh, Larry works for the New Yorker. Uh, he recently wrote an article uh, about Scientology. Oh, I read that. I found that most intriguing. Uh, <laughs> at the time, I was uh, trying to decide who were my characters in the play. And uh, I, Begin, Sadat, and Carter, yes, but anybody else. But Rosalind turns around and says, since when did you start reading the New Yorker? I had my fourth character. <laughs> I needed somebody who could talk to Jimmy Carter like that. And uh, Rosalind was born in the house next door to him. Uh, and Jimmy's going to be 90 on October 1st. So they've known each other for almost a century. And they still have a vital, interesting, and sometimes contentious relationship. And I, I thought I could, I could draw upon that. And after that, we went off to Egypt and Israel to talk to the surviving Delega delegates who were at Camp David, uh, just in time. I feel you know there were uh, some of these things occur at a point in history where you couldn't have done it any later than we did. And I'm glad that we were able to talk to the the people that we did. And and sorry that I missed some of the voices that I would like to have had in this book. Um, and all of this. Um, culminated in a play that uh, premiered at Arena Stage uh, in this past spring. And this is really unusual for uh, a theater company to send uh, a writer out to interview people in Israel and Egypt. And that's, it, you don't meet a lot of playwrights in the Middle East. Uh, you know, there are journalists bumping around, but uh, it, was, uh, it was very useful to get those three perspectives that were all presented at Camp David, I felt I needed to, pre to have voices from each of the three sides equally presented as they were at Camp David. And um, when the play was in rehearsal, I was already writing the book. Uh, I felt that there was so much left to say, uh, and the issues are so complex, and so many of them are on the table once again and have been ever since Camp David. Camp David was a great success, but it did not succeed in the comprehensive piece that, uh, that Jimmy Carter had hoped for. Um, I think it's, y you know, so much tragedy has come out of this region. So many wars, so much terrorism, and uh, so little hope. I think it's common to think that Jews and Arabs are destined to always be enemies and that this conflict is eternal and sh will never be resolved. And that's why I think it's useful to look back at a moment when that was proved not to be true, a moment when Arabs and Jews really did make peace. And it shows us, I think, that it can be done. Um, let's take a look at the three men that were at Camp David. Uh, Jimmy Carter uh, was uh, born in, in Plains. Uh, he's the first, just as a nickel knowledge, the first president to be born in a hospital. 
if you remember, his mother, Lillian, was a nurse. And uh, so she made sure of that. They moved uh, shortly after that to a little town called Archery, near, it's a hamlet really, near Plains. They were the only white family. There were 55 black families in the region. And um, Rosalind says that when Jimmy was a boy, his accent was scarcely distinguishable from his black playmates. Uh, this is essential to understand about Jimmy Carter. Uh, he, he grew up in a, in a world of black people and uh, his best friend in Alonzo Davis, and he would go to the theater in Americas together. Uh, and what that meant was they would go out and flag down the train, and then Alonzo would get in the black car, and Jimmy would get in the white car, and they would go to Americas, and then Alonzo would get up into the balcony, and Jimmy would go downstairs, and then they'd go home in the same manner, and that was going to the movie together. Uh, but he spent all of his time with black playmates. Um, and then he, when he ran for governor the first time, he lost to Lester Maddox, one of the most racist figures in Georgia's history. Um, I, when I was in Georgia, I, I interviewed Lester Maddox. He, uh, he was made famous bec because he chased black customers out of his restaurant with an ax handle and a pistol in his hand. The other th thing he did was, was quite remarkable, ride a bicycle backward. And at the time, that seemed to qualify you for high office in Georgia. Um, but uh, Jimmy was devastated. And uh, this was his born again moment when he had felt that he had to be spiritually renewed. And he immediately began running for governor again. Uh, and his major supporter was an Iranian Jew named David Rabham. Now, Carter didn't know a lot of Jews. Um, he, uh, when he was a boy, the only Jew he really knew was his uncle, Louis Brownstein, an, an insurance salesman in Chattanooga, who could chin himself with one hand, which made a huge impression <laughs> on Jews. The first time he met an Arab was at the Daytona 500. So he, he, he came from a, a background of a lot of biblical knowledge, but very little personal knowledge of the region. And um, so David Rabham was a signal figure in Jimmy Carter's life. He was a wealthy uh, businessman from Savannah. And uh, in addition to the money, he was a pilot. And he would fly Carter around the state to his various uh, speaking engagements. And they spent so much time in the air that Carter learned how to fly the little Cessna while Rabham took catnaps. And one, one time, as they were flying across the state, the engine coughed and died. And uh, Rabham was sleeping, and Carter punched him and said, David, David, you know, what, what? We're out of gas. And then Rabham says, well, then we'll crash. And he let that sit there for a moment. And then he reached down and turned on the spare gas tank. Uh, not a lot of people tease Jimmy Carter. Uh, <laughs> so I think that it indicates to, you know, just how close their relationship was. So later in the flight, uh, Carter said, uh, David, uh, the campaign's almost at an end, and it appears that I'm going to win. I just, I just, you've been such a great supporter of mine. I, I want to know what I can do for you. And Rabham said, Jimmy, I don't need anything from you. What I want you to do is, if you're president, I want you to tell the people of Georgia that we have to get past this racial discrimination that has held us back for such a long time. And so Carter reached into the glove compartment or whatever it is in the Cessna that had its flight map, and he wrote on it, I say to you that the time for racial discrimination is over. And he showed it to Rabham and said, if I'm inaugurated, I will make this statement. And Rabham said, sign it. <laughs> so he signed it, and he said it and, it. and that statement, by itself, so radical in the context of the time that it got him on the cover of Time magazine and planted the seeds of his candidacy. Um, 
If you're no, you want to know who's secretly thinking about running for president, take a look at who's flying to Israel. Uh, in 1973, Carter was secretly making such a consideration, and uh, he was governor, uh, and he and Rosalind flew to do a Holy Land tour. Golda Meir was the prime minister, and she lent them a station wagon, and they drove around Israel and the West Bank, and um, the... Uh, they bathed in the River Jordan. It was very meaningful to two very religious people. Uh, and while they're in the West Bank, they went to a synagogue. And Carter had already been impressed by the fact, that were, at that time he estimated 1,500 settlers, but he could see they were already an obstacle to peace. And um, so there were only uh, two other people in the synagogue. He, he was impressed by how secular the settlers were at that time. And so he returned the station wagon to Golda Meir and he reported to her that they'd been uh, in the synagogue and only two other Jews were there. And he said, you know, in the Bible, when, whenever the Jews turn away from the Lord, he punishes them politically and militarily. And she laughed in his face. The governor of Georgia is telling her this. Uh, a few months later, Amwar Sadat sends this vast Egyptian army across the Suez Canal, and Golda Meir had to step down from her office. Now, Carter came back from Israel determined to do whatever he could for the country of Israel. And he told me that he believed that God had put him in the high office of the presidency to bring peace in the Holy Land. Uh, Walter, Walter Mondale, his vice president, said he was absolutely shocked when on the very first day in office, Carter told him he intended to secure a comprehensive peace in the Middle East, uh, a, a trap for American politicians that, that Mondale was well aware of. So Carter began interviewing uh, Middle East leaders uh, to see if there was someone he could work with. And he was very discouraged by the parade of tyrants and autocrats and so on that came into his office until Anwar Sadat walked into the Oval Office and Jimmy Carter fell in love. He actually said on a number of occasions that he loved Anwar Sadat. It's not the normal language of international diplomacy. and. And his advisors could see that there was some profound connection between these two men. And I've thought about wh where this came from. I, for one thing, they lived, they grew up in very similar circumstances on extremely primitive farms. Uh, Carter used to plow the red clay of South Georgia barefoot behind a mule, and Sadat similarly in the rich black earth of the Nile Delta behind a water buffalo. Uh, very rural, isolated backgrounds. Uh, but I think another factor, I'm just speculating, but I, I think it meant something to Carter that Sadat was black. Uh, Sadat's mother was the daughter of an emancipated African slave, and he inherited her dark coloring. And in Egypt, that also, that, that makes a difference. Um, and uh, I think Carter might have kindled to that. Um, the, yet in Anwar Sadat, he had met a man that was full of surprises and paradox. Uh, when Sadat was a, a boy in this little uh, village in the Nile Delta called Mit Abokum, uh, he was um, following some older boys who were going swimming, and they all jumped into an irrigation ditch, and Anwar jumped in too, and then he remembered, oh, I can't swim. <laughs> and, and he said, this is what he thought. If I die, Egypt will have lost Anwar Sadat. What kind of child thinks like that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so when he was 12, Mahatma Gandhi came through Suez Canal on his way to London to negotiate the future of India. Oh, this made a huge impression on Anwar Sadat that this small brown man could crush an empire like that. And so he took off his clothes and started wearing an apron and made a spindle 
and went up on the top of the roof of his house and started spinning thread. And uh, uh, his father said, come down, you're just going to get pneumonia. But he also had a great admiration for Adolf Hitler. Now, it's not that unusual in Egypt at the time, which was occupied by the British, for them to feel resonance for the war against the British that, that uh, was going on. But even after World War II, after 10 million people are dead, uh, Sadat continued to express admiration for Hitler and what he stood for. He, uh, during the war, collaborated with some Nazi spies. Uh, he went, uh, he was uh, involved in what was, what he called his murder society. Uh, he, uh, there was mainly, it was built on the idea of the French resistance, but essentially what they did was gun down uh, British soldiers who were wandering drunk and alone on the Cairo streets at night. But Sadat redirected their energies to uh, political assassinations. And they tried on two occasions to kill the prime minister, did succeed in killing another government minister, and Sadat went to prison for five years until he escaped. And he then got somehow back into the army, and, um, uh, and then when Sadat died, when Nasser died, Gamal Abdel Nasser was this titanic figure in the Arab world. And uh, in October 1970, he had a heart attack and died. And Sadat was the vice president. And I happened to be living there at that time. And I remember everybody thought he was just a clown. That he, uh, he, for one thing, he missed the revolution. He had been at the movies, uh, a double feature. But, you know, he missed the <laughs> revolution. And uh, people thought, you know, the first strong man will come shove him aside. Uh, Within a year, he had rounded up all of Nasser's corrupt cronies and thrown them in prison. Uh, and then, you know, when I lived there, we had no diplomatic relations with Egypt. There were only a couple hundred Americans in the whole country, but there were thousands and thousands of Russians. And uh, Sadat threw them all out, uh, 50, plus 15,000 Soviet military advisors, uh, which made everybody think that war was out of the question. You know, Egypt couldn't go to war by itself. And then in 1977, he did something that absolutely stunned the world. He was in the Egyptian parliament, and uh, he said, after in the middle of a long speech, I will go to the ends of the earth. I will even go to Israel, to the Knesset, to their parliament, and extend my hand in peace if it would save one more Egyptian life. And everybody applauded because nobody believed it. It was just rhetoric. It wasn't even reported in the newspaper the next day. Even Yasser Arafat, who was there, applauded. But a couple of weeks later, Sadat's plane is circling Tel Aviv. Now, first of all, the flight takes less than an hour. Uh, these are people that are very close neighbors, but they didn't know each other at all. Uh, from the Israeli point of view, they weren't sure that the plane was not going to be stuffed with explosives or terrorists. Uh, Ben-Gurion Airport was ringed with snipers just in case it wasn't Sadat that got off the plane. Uh, the Israeli National Orchestra didn't know how to play the Egyptian national anthem. They didn't have sheet music, so they tuned into Radio Cairo to try to get a sense of how it went, you know. And uh, so, you know, the plane lands, the orchestra strikes up what they think is the anthem, and off the plane comes Anwar Sadat, uh, and he comes down and he embraces Golda Meir and he shakes hands with Ariel Sharon, and this was a thunderbolt, uh, not just in Israel. Uh, but all over the Arab world, uh, that th most of the Arab leaders felt Sadat had betrayed them. Uh, you know, they were disgraced and ashamed by this. Uh, Sadat's own foreign ministers, two of them, one after another, resigned. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Arab delegation that went with him was, uh, they, they felt like they were on Mars. Uh, 
it, the tension was so high that Sadat's bodyguard had a heart attack and died. And uh, the, uh, they had to smuggle him out to make sure that nobody thought some conspiracy was, so they hid his body in the presidential plane. Uh, and all along, the is Israelis were uh, dazed. And, uh, you know, Sadat had come to break the psychological barrier that, that stood between them. But when he did go speak to the Knesset, he laid out his terms for peace. And he did not want to have a separate peace. He wanted a comprehensive peace that included the Palestinians. And his terms were stern. And um, the, some of the joy that had uh, surrounded that event evaporated. And Sadat left Jerusalem empty-handed. Uh, in large part, that was because of Menachem Begin. Begin was, uh, in the history of Jerusalem, you can say that Begin is a turning point. Uh, he, was, he was born in a little Polish town called Brisk. His first memory was a Polish policeman flogging a Jew in a public park. Uh, when the Nazis came, they uh, executed 5,000 Jews in Brisk. Uh, Begin's mother was in the hospital with pneumonia, and the Nazis went through and murdered the patients in the beds. Uh, his father was tied up, rocks were put in his pocket, and he was drowned in the river Bug. Menachem was hiding in Lithuania at the time, and uh, he would spend a couple of years in Soviet gulags before Stalin released all the Poles to fight the Nazis. And the Jewish unit that Begin joined went to Palestine. And it was there that he became the head of Irgun, which was a terrorist organization that was directing its energies at that time against the British, who were in charge of mandated Palestine. Begin was a very imaginative terrorist. Uh, in fact, terrorists in the future would study his playbook. Uh, and Osama bin Laden had read uh, bin, uh, uh, Begin's memoir, Revolt, I, I think because he wanted to see how you make the transition from being a terrorist leader to being a statesman. One of the actions they took against, uh, the Ergun took against the uh, British was to blow up the King David Hotel, at the time the most luxurious hotel in the Middle East. And one part of it served as a headquarters for the British mandate. Ninety-one people were killed. Uh, but Ergun struck again and again, often with eye-catching, headline-making uh, attacks. Uh, for instance, uh, once uh, when British troops flogged uh, some people they thought were committing a crime, uh, you can imagine how that resonated with Begin. So he captured a couple of British officers and had them flogged as well. That went all over the world as news. And then when the British hanged three Ergun terrorists convicted of terrorist crimes, Begin hanged two British sergeants and booby-trapped their bodies. That, that campaign broke the spirit of the British occupiers, and they decided to turn it over, turn over the problem of Palestine to the UN. At that point, uh, Ergun turned his attention to the Palestinians. Uh, in 1948, there was a, a little Palestinian town uh, called Deir Yassin. Uh, it's just outside of Jerusalem. It was on the road to, it was uh, above a, a, a strategic approach to the city. And although it was a peaceful village that had made uh, a non-aggression pact with its ultra-Orthodox neighbors, uh, Begin decided that it had to be taken. His story is, we sent a sound truck in to warn them but at four in the morning. But the truck fell into a ditch, and nobody heard it. And so when the Ergunists encountered some resistance, 
They went through the village, house to house, throwing grenades through the windows, blowing up the houses with TNT. It was a massacre. Palestinians had been leaving Israel before that. But after day, you're just seeing the gates flew open. 750,000 Palestinians fled Israel, and the gates closed behind them. And it was because of Deir Yassin that, the, that that great flight took place. So these were the, the men who came to Camp David. Um, I think, uh, you know, these are the men that actually made peace. And I just want to say a, a little bit about the delegations that were present at Camp David beyond the men. Uh, first of all, there was the American delegation, which was very strongly unified. Uh, Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State, and his big new Brzezinski, who was the National Security Advisor, agreed about very little in their career. But on this issue and at Camp David, they worked in sync, and they worked you know, brilliantly. The, the American team was unsurpassed. The Egyptians were almost united against Sadat uh, in his efforts to make peace. Uh, his, his third foreign minister resigned at Camp David. One night, Carter was so convinced that, uh, that, you know, that Sadat was, you know, he was so worried about Sadat that he woke up convinced that the delegation was going to kill him at Camp David. Uh, he, he woke up Brzezinski at four in the morning who was running around in his pajamas reinforcing the security around Sadat's cabin to protect him from his own people. Uh, the Israeli delegation was like the mirror opposite of that. Everybody wanted peace more than Begin did. Uh, Moshe Dayan, Ezra Weissman, you know, these were titanic figures in Israel's history. And much of their effort during Camp David was to persuade their leader to make the choice for peace. So are there lessons in Camp David that we can draw upon in our own failed efforts now uh, to try to extend peace to the Middle East? I think one that jumps out is there are no perfect partners for peace. Look at who we talked about. We had uh, an assassin and a Nazi collaborator, uh, a terrorist leader, and at the time, a weak and unpopular president. And yet these three men were able to make peace. What they had in abundance, what they shared, was a lot of political courage. Timing isn't everything. We we often hear it's not the right time for peace. But in 1977, 1978, uh, the, uh, the wounds of war were still very fresh. Uh, the 1973 war uh, still it had just occurred. Many Israelis felt like you know they had the Sinai Peninsula. Why would you return it for a piece of paper that says peace on it? It can be torn up at will, but the Sinai is 130 miles of sand that protect us from the main force of the Egyptian army, and the Sinai had been a historic concourse for invading armies. Uh, and moreover, uh, Begin himself did not want to return Sinai. He had made a pledge that he was going to retire in one of the Israeli settlements in Sinai. And uh, so he was... He was very opposed to it when he went to Camp David. Sadat, alone in, uh, in thinking that peace with Israel was possible or even desirable. So, and just to look at it from Carter's point of view, double-digit inflation, the prime rate was 20%. Uh, remember the gas lines? Uh, the, uh, it, it was in the middle of uh, midterm elections. The Shah was about to be overthrown. This was a terrible time for all three men, and yet they took the time. Uh, granted, they didn't think it was going to take 13 days. Uh, Carter had budgeted three or four, and, and Begin said it would be two or three, and they wound up for nearly two weeks locked up in this wooded, uh, campsite <laughs> where Camp David is. Um, 
Uh, the third lesson I think that we can draw from the Camp David success is that America's role in that was crucial. Uh, Carter had, I think, a very mistaken idea when he invited these two men uh, to Camp David. He thought, these are both honorable men. Just get them behind closed doors. They'll get to know each other. They'll get to like each other. They'll come to trust each other, and they will find their own way to peace. That was so far from, within two days, they were so angry at each other. Rosalind said you could hear them screaming at the top of their lungs. Carter had to physically separate them. And uh, by the fifth day, he realized he was going to have to do something he really did not want to do. He was going to have to put forward an American plan. And uh, Carter he works on legal pads, and he, would, he wrote out 30 areas that he thought needed to be resolved. And that was the first of what would be 23 drafts of the American plan. Uh, neither side liked the plan. Uh, but when Sadat, on one occasion, threatened to leave, called for the helicopter, packed his bags, Carter told me he had never been angrier in his life. And he went to Sadat and said, if you do this, our relations will be severed. Our friendship will be over, and Egypt will be alone and friendless in the world. Do you really want to do this? It was a real come-to-Jesus moment. And um, so Sadat stuck it out, but Begin on a couple of occasions threatened to leave, and um, Carter was so angry at him. He said, um, if you do this, I will let the American people know who's responsible. I will tell the Congress that uh, the talks broke up because of your obstinance. And he even had a, one of his speechwriters draw up a speech in which he asked the Israeli people to vote down their government. Can you imagine? Uh, but the pressure that he put on both sides, they all wanted peace. But they couldn't make peace with each other, the Egyptians and the Israelis. But they could make concessions to the United States that allowed them to have the peace that they couldn't make by themselves. Now, those are the lessons I think we can draw from the success of Camp David, but I think there are some lessons we might draw from its failure as well. There are two parts of the Camp David Accords. There is the peace between Egypt and Israel. And in the first 30 years of Israel's existence, there were four wars almost continual warfare between Egypt and Israel. In the 35 years since the Camp David Accords, there hasn't been a single violation of that part of the treaty. One of the things that you learn from working in the Middle East is that things can always get worse. And just think about how much worse things would be if we didn't have peace between those two countries now. But there's a second part of the Accords, and that is peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Now, there were no Palestinians present at Camp David. Um, neither side wanted uh, the Palestinian, the PLO, to be represented. And uh, I don't think that Begin would have come to Camp David if the Palestinians had been represented there. So Sadat uh, was negotiating, and I think Carter as well, for the Palestinians. Um, and even despite the fact, the absence of the Palestinian presence there, uh, every attempt to resolve this dispute since the Camp David Accords has been an effort to realize that portion of the Camp David Accords that has never been implemented. I think with all the lessons that we can draw from Camp David, uh, one thing that I think we can understand is that peace is hard. Peace is very difficult to obtain. But the alternative is unending strife. And I think the final lesson of Camp David is that peace is worth that price. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to entertain your questions.
uh, Brad had reminded us to try to use these microphones. So if you have some questions, maybe. Thank you. Uh, it seems like these three men, maybe not Carter, but certainly trans transcended tremendous limitations. And today, uh, you know, if you think about the last several presidents and any leader you want to name in the Middle East, they're, uh, they, come, we, they come in and we have pin such hopes on them, and yeah. then they generally greatly disappoint. I, is there something, is there a lesson there? Is there anything we can do to help the people who are trying to do this now to transcend rather than disappoint? I think it's a really good question because I— I think there's a big role for citizens on all sides to enlarge the political space for their politicians to operate in. And um, there's very little of that now. The, the language has become so uh, extreme on all sides. And it's, it's fascinating to think back at how things were th considered. Like Begin uh, was uh, interested in you know, he wanted to annex the West Bank, which he called Judea and Samaria. But he would give the Arabs living there citizenship, full citizenship. That thought, you know, one state solution is, you know, nobody in Israel thinks that now. It's, I mean, very few, not in the public discourse. Uh, 25 years ago, you could drive from the, f the western edge of Gaza all the way to Golan Heights without a <coughs> single checkpoint. Uh, there was a free flow of Palestinians, and uh, you know the hundred thousand laborers a day from Gaza alone went into Israel to go to work, and Israelis would go to Gaza for the <coughs> seafood and so on. There was, uh, th th imagine, it was perfectly possible then. Things haven't changed so much, except the mentality on all sides has shifted, and I think that's where citizen discourse can enlarge that kind of thinking and and maybe bring back some of those historic <coughs> precedents. Yes, sir. Sorry, oh, Jim, just a over All right. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, I had occasion to ask uh, Brzezinski a few years ago why he thought the Palestine portions of Camp David had never been fulfilled. And his answer was that Begin never intended to fulfill them, that he had deliberately negotiated so many loopholes into the agreement that it wasn't binding. Do you agree with that? Well, Carter felt um, that on the last night, Saturday night, um, on the 12th day, uh, the, the meeting went on late, late <coughs> at night. And uh, maybe they should have, you know, Carter had said this is the last conversation we're going to have about this. And maybe they should have carried it on to the next day. But there were key issues that were being negotiated at that last moment. And one was settlement activity. Um, Carter believed at the end of the night that he had gotten Begin to agree to stop all settlement activity until the portion of the accords with the Palestinians was implemented. There were five men in the room. There was uh, Moshe Dayan, uh, Begin and Aron Barak, who later became the Israeli Chief Justice, and Barak took notes of the conversation. They're not, they're not dispository. Um, and then Carter and Cy Vance were also in the room, and they both came away convinced that Begin had made this pledge and that he would give a letter the next day of the day of the signing that stipulated that. And so the next day, Barak came and brought a letter to Carter, and it didn't say what Carter expected. And uh, he reminded Barack of what had happened and you know, what they said the night before. Barack agreed with him. And uh, so we'll, you know, they were going to bring the letter on Monday, the day after the signing. So the signing took place on Monday. The letter comes and it's the same letter. So Carter said when Begin got back to civilization, he began lying about it. Uh, Begin is, you know, took great umbrage at that. And, and b members of Begin's delegation say he would never have agreed to surrender, you know, stopping the settlements or, you know, even impinging on uh, anything on the West Bank and Samaria, uh, uh, Judea and Samaria. So 
it's an unresolved issue to this day, but I know that Carter has still has very strong feelings about it. Yes, sir. Uh, two things. Um, I'm Jewish. I'm involved in many Israeli, I mean, Jewish Palestinian groups and trying to bring it to. I'm Jewish, and I've been involved in many Jewish uh, Palestinian groups trying to bring peace. Since the invasion of Lebanon back in uh, 82, you can see we've been quite successful. But at any rate, Carter see I mean, I support Palestinian rights totally in two-state solution, but Carter seems to have gotten mad at Israel. He wrote a book called uh, Apartheid, I mean, Peace Not Apartheid right. in Palestine, and he said he only meant the territories, not Israel. But he said he purposely did. It was explosive words. I think he, he said we could work with Hamas. He, s he seems more and more angry at Israel. I'm, I'm not saying he's anti-Semitic at all, but at Israel. The other question I had is, uh, why did Sadat agree to an agreement that didn't include a Palestinian state? Well, uh, let me answer the second part of that first. A Palestinian state wasn't even on the issue at Camp David. Uh, nobody was pressing for it. Uh, what Begin was offering was autonomy. Uh, both Sadat and Carter wanted some kind of Palestinian entity that would lead to self-determination. It was state-ish. But you know the word Palestinian state was never a part of the accords. The uh, now Carter, it's true he's he's hated a lot by a lot of people in Israel and and a lot of Jews in the U.S. Um, and it's interesting the word apartheid seems to have been the the uh, most inflammatory part of it. But the truth is, it, many Jews turned against Carter right after. Uh, Camp David feeling that he had bullied Israel into this agreement, which he did. Uh, but uh, he was the first Democrat nominee not to get a majority or a plurality. He, he didn't get a majority. He got uh, a plurality. Uh, 45 uh, to Reagan's 40 and then Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he was the first Democratic nominee not to get a majority of the Jewish vote. And so the, the history of. There you have it. <laughs> 45 went for Reagan? 45 went for Reagan? Yeah, he was very much for Reagan. It's a Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, how would you compare and contrast your book to that of William Quantz, which you praise very highly, yeah. and understandably so? I, I, and, and, and Bill Quant was very helpful in, in writing the play and, and my book, so I like his book quite a lot. It's... It's mine is more for general readers, but I think it's also uh, he wrote his right after the Camp David, and I think it, thirty-five years have passed. Mm -hmm. It's time to look back at that, and so uh, and also you know he his is much more exhaustive. He doesn't get to Camp David for the first two hundred pages, so I'm um, I'm trying to be more immediate. And um, Jerry, you have a question after all this time? <laughs> you haven't. I have a statement. <laughs> May I? All right. <laughs> One, you ask about not the not having a follow through on Palest on the Palestinian issue, which, if you read in the book and you'll see, you have seen in the play, Carter said he would do it in his second term, and I've talked to him many times since then, and I'm absolutely sure that had he been reelected there would not have been an inaugural ceremony. He'd have phoned it in from Israel or Egypt while going over there to work, to, and he would stay there till it would be a Palestinian, the Palestinian issue and the uh, settlement issue was settled. And if he had to stay there four years, he would have done it. And well, that would have been in <laughs> plenty of plenty, <laughs> plenty of uh, reason for them to try to come to an agreement. You know. That's right. <laughs> and and uh, as far as people being mad at Carter for the pressure he put on Begin, after the day after the they addressed Congress, and Begin spent ten days here in the U.S. or a week or 10 days and he went to New York and the people from APAC and a lot of his supporters, he said Carter had pressured him to sign this. And that, of course, 
it's make true. Carter un, yeah. un, not too happy. Yeah. And um, but believe me, there is not a bone of anti-Semitism or any kind of bigotry in Carter. Uh, I, w I want to tell a little story before you could come up, but I, I just, one thing I always like to reflect upon is, you know, we don't realize how what a close call this thing was, and every day, um, you know, the ups and downs were so great, um, and the last day, the 13th day, Sunday, uh, when Jerry had notified the networks that uh, the president was going to interrupt the Emmys, and um, and the table was being set up in the East Room and the chairs were being set up, um, the um, there was a side letter uh, that Carter had drafted about Jerusalem, and uh, it was too hot an issue to put into the Accords. Uh, so Camp David has a number of side letters and. This is common, but they, these side letters have no legal standing. They just state the position of one side or the other over a contentious issue, and a very contentious issue is Jerusalem. So uh, Carter's letter, which he promised Sadat he would draft, restated American policy as it had been declared by three UN ambassadors going back to Arthur Goldberg, and he quoted them to the effect that East Jerusalem is occupied territory. So. On Sunday, uh, Begin gets this, you know, this side letter, and he tells Carter, "What's this? You've betrayed me. You know, we, you know, you cannot say this." And he said, "This is American policy. It's not my policy. It's, you know, and uh, uh, you must retract it." Well, I can't do that. I promised Sadat. Well, this is more important. And Carter said he couldn't go back on his word to Sadat. So. Begin called off the signing. He said that there's no signing, there's no accord, this is finished. And Carter was at the lowest point in his life. It, the talks were not only a failure, they were a fiasco. And he walked back to his cabin so depressed. Uh, it happened that there was a photograph made of the three men sitting on the porch of Aspen Lodge, the presidential cabin. And uh, Carter had had copies made up for Begin's grandchildren. And his secretary, Susan Clow, had thoughtfully called Israel and gotten the names of Begin's nine grandchildren. So Carter inscribed each of these and signed it, Love Jimmy Carter. And he realized he had to take the pictures to Begin, but he really didn't want to see him again. But he went back to Begin's cabin, and the conversation was very terse. Uh, Begin was frigid. He had no use for Jimmy Carter at this point. He was, and uh, Carter, you know, essentially they said goodbye. That was it. And Carter handed him the manila envelope with the photographs in it. And Begin looked at the first one, and it was inscribed to his granddaughter, Michal, and then to his grandson, Jonathan. And he began to weep. This obstinate you know, force had, you know, been such a difficult partner all through this, and suddenly he broke, and Carter also began to cry. And he said, I had hoped to write, this is where your grandfather and I made peace in the Middle East. And so he walked back to his cabin to tell Sadat that the signing was off, and the phone rang, and Begin said he would sign. History turns on such little moments, doesn't it? Do you have it? Um, yeah, you were speaking earlier on the legacy of the Accords on future talks, um, and in particular the failure of the Palestinian part of it. Um, what, how could you reflect on the legacy of the Accords had maybe on the failed Camp David talks 20 years later? Um, it, the format was clearly trying to follow what Carter had done, mm -hmm. and then in particular what kind of factors were present at the Camp David Accords that might not have been there for the for the failed talks 20 years later? First of all, I think that the the question was, you know, how did the Camp David, the Carter Camp David, uh, reflect, of, is ref how is that reflected in the later Camp David, the Clinton C Camp David, uh, with Ehud Barak and, and, and uh, Yasser Arafat? Um, I th 
to begin with, I think that the Palestinians are a harder problem, and uh, that's that that made it much more difficult. Uh, Carter, I mean Clinton, did not put America's relationship on the table. Um, you know, with Carter, that was the the that's the card that made everything happen. But Clinton was not willing to do that, and um, and I I understand. You know, people have very strong feelings about Arafat walking away from the deal, 90% of the land and all that, you know. And there were real reasons why he did that and difficult political things that he would have. To, but I so wish he had uh, because the drift of events now is, uh, is so extreme. And if there is to be a second state, you know, when I look at the settlement activity and now the talk in Israel of annexing 60% more of the West Bank, it's, and it seems like what is in the works is a second Gaza. And we, we don't want that. You know, we're going to, I think we're going to institutionalize this, uh, this conflict if we do that. Uh, and I, I do think we get so discouraged thinking about um, how it'll never change, but I, I reflect on the fact that I am the same age as Israel. I was born in 1947, which is the year that the UN decided to partition Israel and Palestine. And um, in my lifetime, several impossible things have happened. I grew up in the segregated South, and now we have a black man who's president. I grew up in an era of apartheid, which is long since gone. I grew up in the Cold War. Uh, and the Soviet Union is dissolved. History does change. It's not immutable. And, uh, it's, but I think we have to open our eyes and our hearts to the possibility that this too can change and should change because the status quo does never stays in one place. But the way things are going right now is in a bad direction. Yes, ma'am. Two more. All right. Yes, ma'am. It just as, as an aside, when you said that some of the lessons that we can learn from this peace with Egypt is that you cannot wait for the perfect partners. Yeah. I think that another lesson is that we cannot wait for the perfect peace because the peace treaty with Egypt is not really the conventional peace treaty. It's called in Israel the cold peace. Right. It is really more a non-aggression pact than anything else because it did not follow but not only with any significant economic and social relationship with Egypt, but also uh, Egypt had uh, Sadat had, uh, had political goals in terms of getting this kind of help, you know, assistance, United States right. assistance, start to fall to, to flow to Egypt. In well, I, I I get your drift. I I, I think that the point is that this is, uh, I I would she says it's not really a conventional peace treaty, um, but. I disagree in this sense. Uh, both sides had to make real sacrifices. You're correct that it is not loved on either side. And I think that's an indication of how hard it was to achieve the peace that they did. The, the compromises they had to make are still, still painful. No, I do not minimize the significance yeah. of this agreement, yeah. you know, whether you call it peace or anything else. And moreover, somebody asked why about the peace, the peace effort of Clinton and, yeah. and, and Barack. Uh, I recall that even after signing this kind of document with Egypt, when it came to the negotiations with Jordan that came afterward, Egypt was not exactly friendly towards it. Yeah. And they were not friendly at all towards the attempts of a of, uh, Palestinian-Israeli agreement during the uh, Barack, uh, right. Barack Clinton talks. 
So it is really much more problematic. I don't know if that was assassinated. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to uh, take our last question, but I agree that it's, you know, this is not a, uh, it, it, it hasn't been, this is a peace treaty. It doesn't mean that the people have fallen in love with each other, but I would say that Israel and Egypt are closer now than they ever have been, and it wouldn't be possible without the treaty. I think some of the Egyptian delegation at the time said that this was going to be Sadat's death's death warrant. If he signed it, yeah. he wouldn't survive, and of course he didn't. Uh, how does Carter look back on that? Does he does he think that he pushed the man he loved into signing his death warrant? I mean, is he, how does he think about that now? You know, Carter, I, I asked him about it, and uh, he doesn't. In, he he agrees that you know that Sadat paid a price, but you know uh, he doesn't seem to assume that that was uh, his responsibility. Um, the he felt that Sadat was risking his life and that he lost his life, but it was worth the sacrifice. And, you know, each of these guys paid a price um, in different ways. You know, Carter, um, you know, he, he, it was the Iraq hostages that really uh, destroyed his political career. But, uh, you know, he, he's, he's paid a price in his reputation in the Middle East. Begin right after uh, the, the accords were signed two years after the, he, he invaded Lebanon, not worried any longer about Israel, I mean about Egypt on his flank, so he felt he had a free hand to go in for what he thought would be two or three days, and it lasted 18 years. Uh, and he spent the last nine years of his life in exile uh, in his apartment, uh, seeing no one. Um, there was a it, it was, uh, you know, the last time they talked, they met at Sadat's funeral. They didn't talk. But um, 10 years after the Camp David Accords were signed, uh, Carter went to, an anor to a reunion of the uh, delegates in Israel, and Begin didn't come because he was at that time uh, a recluse. And uh, uh, Carter said he really would like to talk to to Begin, and so uh, Yekel Hadashai, who was uh, uh, Begin's longtime assistant, uh, got Begin on the phone and said, uh, you know, Mr. Carter is here, Mr. President Carter is here, and uh, he would like to talk to you, and so Begin said, put him on the phone, and uh, so Carter said, you know, Mr. Begin, how, you know, good to talk to you, yes, how is Rosalind, she's fine, and he said, goodbye, Mr. President. And that was their last conversation. Well, and this apparently is my last uh, conversation, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Yeah.